Welcome to the link on the breeze 93.9. Proudly brought to you by Cabo Select Care, IT and E, Cabo Enterprises. And also uh, coming up, we'll get a cover me from Burger King, and we're gonna have another great video uh, from Joe Guam. Holiday Feels brought to you by Windward uh, Memorial. Uh, Nine o'clock. Let's head into the KUAM News Zoom Room where. The big hit this morning is the pumpkin pumpkin uh, spice bananas dogu. <laughs> oh, I'm, not, mangi, mangi. I'm not sure how my grandma would feel about it. That you know, God rest her soul. But you know, it's 2020. Anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to try chocolate chip bananas dogu. <laughs> or, or how about the what is it ube? Yeah. Ube <laughs> oh dang. <laughs> there you go. Well, we do have one comment okay. I want to get to real quick, guys. Yes. Uh, Okay, when you guys were talking about Bree's uh, Baking Club, mm -hmm. and Chris is, uh, let's just say, you're, you're a man of many talents. Maybe baking desserts is not one of them. Mm. Um, we got, somebody said make a, oh, Tori Matanuni says make a tuna casserole Christmas tree. That actually sounds pretty cool. And uh, Tori also said, Chris, bake a Frosty the Snowman out of baked potatoes. Mm. All right. That would work. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm expecting something amazing for me. Great. Burnett. No pressure at all. <laughs> I might just pull one and buy it at the bakery and then put it in a pan. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I made that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, 901, let's uh, go to the KUAM News Zoom Room where, again, we have uh, Simon Sanchez of the CCU uh, standing by. Good morning, Simon. Buenas, Chris. Buenas, Serena. Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas. We're making a lot of solar energy right now. <laughs> <laughs> On that good. note, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. let's go ahead. And I know that uh, GPA had had uh, some definite concerns about this. Uh, is it 219, Brie? 219. It's uh, currently on the session agenda, actually. And it's down in the voting file. They vote. They, uh, it, oh, so, wow. That was yeah, quick. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that uh, Bill 219, it, it relates to uh, the purchase or lease back of renewable energy, a uh, purchase of service for the Department of Education, the Guam Academy Charter School, the Guam Community College, and the University of Guam. And so, Simon, I guess if you could tell us what are specifically are the concerns uh, uh, for the CCU about this uh, proposed legislation? Well, you know, the CCU, the Guam Power Authority, and the Independent Public Utilities Commissions have all come out against the way the bill is written, mm -hmm. uh, not the concept. You know, uh, we, we're we we're the largest provider of solar energy on Guam, the Guam Power Authority is. We've got 25 megs already. We've contracted for another 120 megawatts, and we're under protest, which we've won so far, for another 40 megs. So uh, we, we, we are an advocate for solar energy because it reduces... The amount of fuel we purchase and as you cover all the time the fuel is 50 to 70 percent of your bill depending on the price of oil and the less oil we use the better so solar allows us to use less oil that new generator that we're building will use 18 million gallons a year of less oil and and sort of be the backup in terms of reliability because some of the what gets lost often in the conversation is solar energy can make energy competitively with conventional energy but when the, when the sun goes down at night, you, it doesn't make any energy. So what good is cheap energy if it's not available 24 seven, right? And that's why if you look at how it's done throughout the world, you know, 99% of the utilities and 100% and of the utilities that have an isolated grid uh, use a combination of renewables plus conventional generation because the mix makes it, gives you reliable power and the mix gives you cheaper power. And maybe there'll come a day where our children and our grandchildren will be able, you know, the goal for Guam is now 100% renewable. Speaker Ben and us worked together in 2008. We said, let's get to 25% by 2035. Well, the good people of the Guam Power Authority, we're gonna get there in two years, but we're gonna get there in two years, plus get rid of those old cabris units that burn the wrong fuel and burn too much fuel and have that new generator in Dededo that burns less fuel and cleaner fuel so that the combination gives you lower energy cost but reliable power you know 24 7. We, we don't want the we don't we don't want power from solar only during the day we want power all the time so you, it's a mix and and uh, and and so that's what we've been working on and mm -hmm. gpa has a 25 megawatt solar farm already working 
We've got contracts for 120 megawatts that are coming online under construction now. And, and that those contracts, we only pay six to eight cents a kilowatt hour for that solar, uh, solar energy. And we have another contract that has batteries and we're only gonna pay 11 cents a kilowatt hour for that energy. Right now there's 2,500 citizens that have put up their own solar system and 99% of them, I'm, I'm pretty sure, 90, you know, don't have a battery. They just have the solar array. They make the energy on a beautiful day like today. But when it's raining like it was yesterday at three o'clock, they ain't making much energy. When they're not making energy for themselves, when it's nighttime, they get their energy from the ratepayers that own the Guam Power Authority, the generators, the distribution and transmission lines that get the power to all of our houses. That's paid for by 48,000 ratepayers of Guam. Currently, as a it was a conscientious policy decision of GPA and the independent PUC, we said, look, let's let solar uh, individual solar systems come online, but let's cap it at 25 megawatts uh, so we can see what the impact is. Because there's a lots of debate about the impact, but at the end of the day, once you can see the impact, you can allocate the cost of that impact. What should the system pay? What should the individual user pay? So we, we've successfully got 25 megs from 2,500 individual citizens. That still leaves 47,000 other ratepayers we got to think about. And that's where they benefit from the Dun Dun Solar Farm, from the 120 megawatts that's going up in Mangilao, and from this, this other uh, contract we're waiting to award. And next early next year, a 40 megawatt battery will come online and eliminate about 80% of those dumb five minute outages that occur when we lose one of our generators anywhere and we have to turn on an, an idle generator to replace that energy. And there's a gap, five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes. That battery will step in and provide us energy when a generator goes offline so that you don't have those, those five minute outages. But a 40 megawatt battery costs $40 million. Mm -hmm. And it's why 99% of those that do have solar on Guam don't have a battery because GPA ratepayers are essentially the battery. At night, the generators in Cabris or in Dededo are sending power to everyone, including solar customers, right? When the clouds come over and all of a sudden, instead of getting you know, this much energy, you get less energy, GPA makes up the gap, right? And, and that's where this whole concept of what's fair compensation when Sabrina's solar system gives us energy, what should I pay for that energy? And versus when I, when GPA ratepayers give Sabrina back energy like at night, you know, what do we, what do we charge for that energy? And that's, that's called net metering because we net out what did Sabrina give us and versus what did we give you? And if Sabrina gave us more than we gave her, and, and that often happens with a solar customer, then we need to compensate her for that because she helped us, right? And, and, but when, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And we've never argued over the idea that a individual solar system or any solar system saves us fuel. So we'll compensate anyone that puts a solar array the LIAC, the equivalent of the LIAC, which right now is eight cents a kilowatt hour, but the base rate is 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So for the sense, uh, sake of discussion, let's call, we, right now we pay 20, uh, you pay about 21 cents a kilowatt hour, okay? The wonderful thing about solar, oops, sorry about that. the wonderful thing about utility scale solar is we're now getting utility scale solar at six cents a kilowatt hour, six to eight cents in Mangila. And the one under protest, we're gonna get 40 megawatts at about 11 cents a kilowatt hour, and it's gonna even have a battery. So why should we pay the, the, so one of the arguments is why should we pay 21 cents a kilowatt hour for solar energy from an individual when we can make our own for eight to 11 cents a kilowatt hour, right? The independent PUC is aware of all of this. And, and we agreed with them that said, look, let's still let people put, put uh, individual systems online. But when we get to 25 megawatts, let's study the impact. Well, we're at about 25 megawatts from 2,500 individual individuals, right? And and uh, and they were going to study the impact to see what's the fair compensation. Why is that important? When a solar provider sells you a system, and like in this case, we want a solar provider to sell DOE or UOG or GCC a system. They say, here's the cost of the system. Oh, but GPA is going to pay you 21 cents a kilowatt hour for when you give them more energy than you take from them, right? The PUC has said, we'll leave it at 21 for now, but we wanna do a study. 
because there's a there's been an argument for years now that says 21 is too expensive. You save us fuel, but but at night you're using the system. You're, why should you get GPA ratepayer system for free when and make the other ratepayers pay for your energy and pay for the generator that you're using power at night, the transmission line that brings the power to your house? Why should you get that for free and everyone else pay for not only their cost of, of that, they're going to pay for your cost of that. Mm -hmm. And and that's why the PUC came out and, and they're independent, right? They're appointed for six years. Uh, they're not elected. And, and they came out and, and said, this is a problem, right? And they were just about to conduct the study that they were they, they were, had promised they would to study the impacts and they want to see that number come out. But Bill 219 creates two problems for the PUC. It doesn't allow them to set the net metering rate uh, for the schools that they, and frankly for anybody, it, it, but in this case of Bill 219, for the schools, the institutions, that's what they're called, it doesn't allow them to set the rate. It, 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 and, and that is a violation of the Organic Act. Because if you remember when Chris was a baby and Sabrina, I don't think you were here yet, there was a, a <laughs> senator who became famous when the legislature controlled the rates for not allowing rate increases. And, and what, did, what, led to, what happened was GPA defaulted on a loan payment. And also GPA had no money to fix anything. So you had the load shedding blues, two bad things, a loan default and load shedding blues. So the federal government amended the Organic Act and said, hey, we'll bail you out on this bond, on your loan default, but we want an independent PUC uh, that can't be changed, you know, thrown out by a governor. And we want the legislature out of rate setting. And the legislature, and so that's how the PUC was created 30 years ago. And Chairman Duenas and I were actually certain on the PUC. So I'm very familiar with the PUC side of the picture and how you set rates and how you design them. And in the current rate design, government subsidizes residential. The government rate should actually be a little lower and the residential rate should be a little higher. But for 30 years, we've said, hey, government, Don Maria needs the help. You're gonna subsidize, right? Bill 219 eliminates the ability of the PUC to revisit that case. And the PUC and GPA and CCU all agree that the way it's written, there's about seven, $8 million a year that would be lost from the schools of Guam, the institutions that would benefit from a solar rate but that would be lost from the base rate contribution. Remember, if you save us fuel, we'll pay you for that. But to get the system for free, the base rate that pays for the generators, the employers, the, the employees, the maintenance, the bonds that pay for all of this stuff. Right now they don't pay for it. This bill would continue that, uh, that unfairness where, mm -hmm. where, and in effect, the rate payers of Guam that don't have solar would be paying for the schools that have solar and the real beneficiary are the folks that sell the systems to, to the schools. And, and they, they're probably the strongest proponent. You, you may have seen a letter from uh, MRE, Jeff Balcola. And, and I'm not surprised if they're saying, don't change the bill, don't change the bill. Why? Because it's be the higher the reimbursement from GPA is to a solar customer through net metering, the better for them. They can, they can charge higher prices or they, at least they can tell, Sabrina, your power bill after I put a $10,000 system on your house and GPA pays you 21 cents a kilowatt hour, see how your power bill goes down. But what if GPA only pays you 15 cents a kilowatt hour, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, right? Th then Sabrina's gonna go, well now, you know, the savings from your power bill is how you're gonna pay your, the guy that's selling you your solar system. So the idea is DOE will save money on the power bill they got to save some of that to pay the guy putting on the system, but they also would get reimbursed by GPA. And the PUC is saying, hey, let us set that rate. Do not, and, and you can't violate the Organic Act when you put language in the bill that says, restricts the PUC's ability to set that rate. And that's and that's the PUC's argument. I mean, mm -hmm. they, and so we got a letter, the bond council for the, 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 their name is Oric, the law firm. They have been the bond council since Joe Atta was the governor. They've survived every governor because they're very good. And the bond council sent a letter that we sent to all the senators reminding them that the bill as written violates the Organic Act because it violates the independent PUC's ability to set rates. And it violates the bond covenants that the legislature promised it would not violate because one of the bond covenants say is you will not interfere with the ability of the PUC or GPA, GPA to run the system and the PUC to set rates for the system. And Bill 219 violates both of those. Mm -hmm. So so having said so, that, having said that, uh, you know, 
that it violates um, all of those issues. And looking at the fact that the PUC submitted testimony in October, uh, raising their concerns and, you know, telling senators, hey, you know, <laughs> pull this back, you know, don't enact it. It's going to result in uh, higher uh, rates for uh, rate payers. But yet this bill is in the voting file. So has there been any well, dialogue I mean, or anything to s with, with uh, Senator St. Augustine, who's the author of this bill? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, my impression, I, I did speak to the Senator St. Augustine, and, and, you know, he's been quite collaborative because this is the accept, second attempt for the legislature to try to write a bill that would allow the school systems to get solar. The first attempt passed six or eight years ago. We weren't consulted. PUC wasn't consulted. And it, it was a mess. It didn't work. That's why it was never implemented. So Senator St. Augustine and the current legislature is trying to write a better version of it, and, and they've taken a good shot at it, but, but in doing this better version, they still have written it in a way that it violates the Organic Act, it violates bond covenants, and it put, it still forces GPA ratepayers to subsidize the schools. And, you know, GPA ratepayers, they don't have any money to, they have the money to pay their own bills. They don't have the money to pay somebody else's bills. And, and both in the PUC, the CCU, and the GPA, uh, we've testified on this before that we can fix the, the parts of the bills that work, you know, that allow them to bid out are fine. But the parts where the rates can't be uh, established by the PUC, and, you know, it's a little complex. You have to read the bill. But in effect, the way it's written, it does limit the PUC's ability to set rates. And the bond council agrees. The way it's written violates the independence of the PUC. Therefore, it violates the Organic Act, and it violates the bond covenants. And, and we saw it as well. And so we all agree. Yes, they voted it down. I mean, they sent it down, but they can pull it back out. They can amend it. And uh, one of the things we're open to a discussion with Senator St. Augustine, and he's been very receptive, is if he's inter if, if he's interested, we can we can help see if we can fix 219 and amend the bill to to eliminate the, the restrictions on the PUC. And and there's one other thing. There's one that that is just we can't be in the bill. A solar provider for Southern High School can't cite the solar array in GIGO and credit it to the Southern High School in Agate. You, you can't, and this bill allows what's called offsite location. You know, UOG, when you get a solar array, it's gotta be on your property. The 2,500 people that have solar system, it's on their property, it's on their rooftop, you know, it's on their property. But the, the advocates uh, that wanna sell the systems, they wanna be able to say, hey, I wanna, I, you know, Southern High's too small, right? Uh, there's not enough land. I wanna do it in GIGO and on behalf of Southern High, but I want the free cost of the transmission system from GIGO to Southern High. I want that for free. I want the other ratepayers of Guam to give that to me for free. And we're just saying that is cannot be allowed. And so uh, if you took that section out and, and, um, and preserve the power of the PUC to set the rate, then we might have something, right? And, and that's, what, uh, that's why we wanted to raise such an alarm to the community, the ratepayers of Guam who own GPA, they're the ones at risk. They're the ones that are going to have to pay a higher rate if this bill passes as is. And, 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 and of course, it creates all the other problems. How does PUC and GPA implement an illegal law? You know, I, mean, it just, I mean, so now we're doing the right thing in the wrong way. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see if, if the, the good senator is open to allowing us to help. Um, you know, and one of the things I've, I've, I've spoken to a number of them privately, I said, look, you're all coming back next year too you know if we can't fix this in the next seven eight days because it's the last session of the year you know we can we're close we're very close we're much better than that other bill six years ago but you know while you fixed one thing you don't want to hurt another thing and right now the bill is written uh takes a good idea and does it in the wrong way and will force other ratepayers and there's 48,000 ratepayers that don't have a solar system to come up with the money that the school system would have otherwise paid, you know, they would have saved on the fuel. That's for sure. Their bill will go down with the solar array, but it's that other part of the bill, the, the base rate uh, that a school needs. Who does the school need at night uh, for the evening basketball game? They can't rely on their solar system. They're going to rely on the ratepayer system, ratepayer owned system of the Guam power authority. It's and someone has to pay that cost and the bill as written exempts the schools from paying that cost. Mm -hmm. And that's not fair. And the PUC is the one that should judge what's fair. Uh, they're, they're independent.
Right? It, it just, so, it, you know, as an elected representative of, of the ratepayers, my job is to fight for the ratepayers' interests. Mm -hmm. And right now the bill is written, uh, helps one small group of ratepayers, but it's at the expense of everyone else. And we just don't think that's right. It just makes me wonder, like, what's the purpose of having a, a public hearing and accepting public testimony if when it goes to session floor, there's no amendments made, no concerns that are taken into consideration from, yeah. you know, yeah. CCU or PUC. And it's like, go to the voting file. Yeah. And then here we are today. Right, right. And, and there, <laughs> right, right. And there's no, there's no impact statement. You, you see the bill, there's no impact statement. They, and, and they throw in these wonderful words, right? You know, we are all for solar and all that. And, you know, the irony is if you look at all the sponsors, right? And I, uh, I think it's the speaker and Senator St. Augustine and then Senator Clint Rogel signed on as well, right? None of them have a solar system. They're all customers for the Quant Power Authority. So, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and really GPA is saying, look, solar is becoming so much more affordable at the utility scale level, right? Why would we pay 21 cents for when we're getting bidders offering us six, eight, 11 cents and the 11 cents is with a battery. Another way to think about it is, is it better to have the thousand houses in Liguan have a thousand systems and a thousand batteries on their houses? Or is it better for a utility scale solution to be there? So you have one battery for a thousand homes mm -hmm. or 2000 homes. You have one system, you know? So those are the kinds of, of dynamics that exist. And, and, and the other thing that is, is that, and we're very disappointed because we've sh showed this to the legislature before. Kauai gets about 70% of its energy from renewables. And on some days, a hundred percent, but they also have wind and hydro, but they have a lot of soap. Okay, and, and we don't have wind and hydro and they're like one well, isolated system. And, and one of the mistakes the legislature of, the, often makes is they compare us to Los Angeles or the mainland. The mainland has an integrated system across the country. L.A. only makes about 30, 40 percent of its power. You know where it gets the rest of its power? Wind energy in Oklahoma, your old, your old <laughs> hometown, solar energy in Palm Springs. Right. That's where they get the energy from. Right. Because they can ship it over. We can't ship over energy from Japan or mm -hmm. Palm Springs, California. We're an isolated grid. And U2 was a very important lesson as well, which is why we're building the generator up north. And, and Micronesian Energy, you know, they, I, you know, I'm good friends with them, even though we don't agree, right? In, in Saipan, 20% of their customers lost um, their panels from U2. And they were able to get them back up in two, three, four weeks and, and, and back to normal, right? If we're 100% renewable, and Typhoon Malafunction shows up in 2028 and or 2030 and wipes out 20% of the solar array. How do you keep the lights on? You know, and as John Benaventi said, you know, he said, he said for that other bill that we opposed, that bill passes, I'm buying a generator. And that's what that generator in Dededo is for. It's to provide reliable power when, when renewables are not reliable, like at night, or when you have heavy cloud cover. And in Kauai, what happened was they, they have so much solar but they have five days of rain. Have we ever had five days of rain on Guam? They had five days of rain where guess what? The solar panels couldn't make energy. The solar panels couldn't recharge the batteries. So people were now buying power from Kauai Electric and then Kauai Electric's generator failed and you had load shedding for a week. And it's now happened twice in the last three years. And we keep showing this to the legislature that says, wait a minute, there's a wise way to bring renewables and there's a dumb way to bring renewables. And Kauai, who's way ahead of us, is showing exactly the risk if you don't have some conventional energy available when you're an isolated grid, like a Kauai or Guam, you better have a backup while, while you migrate to as much renewable energy as you can to, low, to avoid burning oil. But when you need it, when you have five days of rain or when a typhoon wipes out 20% of the solar array, you got to make that up with something. And that's what that generator up north is going to do. It's going to eliminate the cabris units that are fuel inefficient and burn a dirty fuel. It burns a cleaner fuel. It burns less fuel. And, and in 2045, we're supposed to be 100%. In 2045, we'll have paid off that generator. So if we're 100% in 2045, turn it off. Don't, we already own it. But if typhoon malfunction shows up in 2047 and wipes out 30% of the solar array and we need two, three, four months to put it back, that generator that we've already paid for, put some gas in it and run it and you keep the lights on. Because it doesn't matter if your power is cheap, if it's not reliable and you can't get it when, when you need it and everybody needs it 24-7. Well, and that's the whole logic of this. This is uh, the, the reason why we need you back in the legislature. <laughs> 
No, no, you know, I, 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 to be honest, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I mean, you know, if it was part time, maybe that's what I like about the CCU. But you know, I've been able to contribute to my community with water and 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 with energy and water and wastewater and, and on a part time basis at the CCU. And you know, that's I, I'm comfortable with that. I, I've been, and you know, the people of Guam have been very good to me. They've allowed me to serve them. This is my fifth term. I, I've been there from the beginning. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I want this to work for everybody. I, uh, you know, I, and, and I get $500 a month for worrying about this stuff, right? But, but it's important to me. It's important to my children and grandchildren that they have clean water, a good way to deal with our wastewater, and reliable energy at the lowest cost. You need those two, though, reliable and low cost. And the plans that we've put into place are much more prudent than the ones that we see from folks that are well-meaning, but they're not subject matter experts. Not, nobody in the legislature has run these systems. The experts are at the Guam Power Authority. The experts, the Guam Power Authority has signed up for more solar. It's putting in more solar. It's putting in batteries. We know what we're doing. And we've put out the bids, like Chris was saying. We've put out the bids. We've got reliable bidders that are giving us good bids. And there are good providers on Guam that can provide solar systems like MRE, uh, Bill Hagen's company, Pacific Solar. Uh, there's a there's a couple of GRE. They're, they're there, and I'm 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 sure they'll bid. And but hidden in their bid is the question: How much is GPA going to reimburse the schools for the net energy that they give us? How much are the ratepayers going to pay for that energy? And we're arguing if we're getting solar energy for six, eight, eleven cents. Why should we be paying the 21 cents we're paying now? And the PUC wants to visit that, but they're not being allowed to. In fact, they're being prevented by 219. And that's just going to mean, well, if that law, if it becomes law, then we're going to have to raise the rate on Sabrina and Chris and Don Maria while UOG saves some money. And I, you know, that, you know, it's a zero sum game. You take away mm -hmm. from here, you got to take it, you give it back from somebody else. And that's what the PUC said. That's what we've said. That's what GPA said. And we're hoping we can get the body to reconsider the bill as 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 it stands. They can pull, you know, you can pull a bill out of voting file. You can mm -hmm. amend it. And and uh, so I've reached out to Senator St. Augustine, and, and he's always been very collaborative. That's why this bill is better than the first one. And uh, if he's open to it, we we think we can we can amend it and and give it a shot at doing the right thing in the right way instead of the right thing in the wrong way. Well, thank you for coming to our TED okay. talk. <laughs> Thanks, well, I and, and thank you for using energy. Right on. Okay, William uses a. Oh, we're using a lot. a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. The, the phone light is on. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, I. Just get that hot air that comes out of the, that one microphone. <laughs> you know, try to harvest that. Wait, who's microphone? A, uh, a kilowatt hour. <laughs> Thanks, I. Hey, grab some uh, uh, pumpkin scup, uh, spice, bananas, dog, and virtual uh, on your way out. We'll do, Chris. Fried Merry with Christmas, solar, everybody. Right. Yeah. Merry uh, Christmas. Hopefully, we can resolve this too. Okay, see ya. Yeah. Hopefully Good we luck. can resolve this to the benefit of the community. Right on, yep. yeah. Good I don't luck. know. It's like every bill the legislature's coming out with, everyone's like, oh, hold on there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the chamber, that was a third the bill. Realtor, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Hey, uh, we're going to take a break. 928. Uh,